Uh, this is the third annual uh, Spring Creativity Conference that is sponsored by the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity. This meeting has taken the place of, actually it's the fourth one if you want to talk about our first Baja one, uh, but it has taken the place of the Central Division meeting of the, of the Society for the Philosophy of Creativity. The Central Division, division meeting was, uh, let's, just, let's just say it wasn't doing creativity very much good. Uh, or us. And so what we decided to do uh, was move our Central Division uh, Society uh, down. It's now based in the American Institute of Philosophical and Cultural Thought. Um, and this is, this, is the, this is our Central Division meeting now. And so for the last three years, we've had six papers. Um, and one of the things we discovered is that especially by the magic of YouTube and the internet that we're reaching thousands of people now instead of 10 or 12 who don't care, uh, which is what was happening at the philosophy meeting. And so, so anyway, this is a very, very good sort of uh, move for the foundation for the philosophy of creativity to get its, um, um, its message out and to fulfill its mission. I see that the uh, um, executive director of that foundation is with us today. He couldn't be with us yesterday, but Corey McCall is here. And so, Corey, I'm going to call on you to say just a word or two about the foundation. Sure. Um, the foundation has been around for quite a while, started in the 1950s, um, and has been going strong ever since, um, doing our best to promote um, the study of creativity um, grounded in philosophy, but not based exclusively in philosophy. Um, so looking at creativity is a, is a sort of interdisciplinary endeavor. And apologies for not being able to be in attendance yesterday, but I'm looking forward to the uh, papers and the discussion today. Okay, thanks, Corey. Uh, so uh, we have six papers, three were yesterday, and I want to uh, thank our speakers from yesterday. It was a really good, I thought, a, a really great session. Um, I learned some stuff and uh, got upset over some things, and that's 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 all. That's always a good. <laughs> it's always a good sign, I think. Um, so today we have three more. This year's uh, theme is creativity and culture, and the papers that we have uh, are mostly sort of destined for this volume that Eli and uh, Chemek Burstika, who spoke yesterday, and Martin Richter, who I think is with us, right? yeah, there you are, um, uh, today, are editing. Uh, I helped a little bit with this volume, and it's probably coming out in Eli's book series, but I'm gonna say a word about that in a second. It's, it hasn't gone through the process that it needs to go through, but it's a really outstanding volume, in my opinion. I'm not really worried about it. The idea that the um, that the referees for Brill are going to somehow not want this book, I'm pretty sure they're going to want it. <laughs> and so, uh, so in any case, um, uh, the uh, uh, the American Institute of Philosophical and Cultural Thought, as I said yesterday, was founded to sort of take up the mission of the Center for Dewey Studies at SIUC, but with an expanded sort of agenda. And so, with that uh, in mind. My house, which is a great big old 1880 Victorian thing, uh, became a library with 30,000 books in American philosophy <laughs> in it. And you are all welcome to visit because uh, we're vaccinated now. You can just bring coronavirus right on in here. We don't mind. Um, and, and so uh, for the last uh, four, well, it's a little more than four years now, four and a half years, um, we have been hosting all kinds of seminars, workshops. Uh, dissertation fellows. We've got a dissertation fellow coming May 2nd. I'm really looking forward to that. She'll be, she's uh, from Polish Academy of Sciences, in fact, and mm. she'll be with us for three weeks working on a uh, dissertation on Robert Nozick and ec economics. So that, I'm really looking forward to that. A lot of you guys know that. I'm, I'm speaking Helen Milne, if you know her. She's, she's coming here to do her dissertation research. So AIPCT, uh, you'll find us on the YouTube channel. That, uh, that is dedicated to us and our website, which I'm, I'm gonna put the YouTube channel and the website into the chat as soon as I get done with, this, uh, with these opening remarks. And the YouTube channel will host all six of these papers uh, for the, the conference. All right, so I will put our website, AIPCT website in the chat and also the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity website and our YouTube channel, I'll put all that in. So 
Let me move to our first speaker for today. Eli Kramer is, uh, a, uh, he was a former student of mine, and this is the thing I'm fondest of, not the former part, but the student part. Um, the, uh, uh, he went to SIU and did his master's degree and his PhD here. Um, and to, to, to try to describe the reach of his work is not an easy thing to do. It has something to do with history, something to do with ethics, something to do with metaethics, something to do with metaphysics, uh, and, and it's spread out all over the globe. Uh, and so uh, he's actually well situated in Poland being in something like the northern middle of the world so that he can, so that he can reach east and west uh, from where he is. Uh, after, well, as he was completing his dissertation work and research uh, on a, a system of metaethics for philosophy as a way of life, um, if you can believe that. <laughs> so the principles of philosophic community. So philosophy as a way of life, and in fact, uh, uh, he has continued to build on this idea of, uh, of principles for philosophical communities, and has, working with a member of his dissertation committee, Michael Chase, and also a colleague from Australia, uh, Matthew Sharp, they have put together a new book series in philosophy as a way of life, and Eli's book will be one of the first books out in that Theories, and it's called Principles of Philosophical Community with a long subtitle that I can't remember. Uh, but, uh, but in any case, uh, uh, Eli is assistant professor at the University of Wrocław uh, in, in Poland, and he has the most enviable of positions, which is to say he doesn't even have to teach. He's a research professor. Um, this is like, this is the job I want. I mean, this is not, I love teaching, don't get me wrong, and it's ironic because Eli loves teaching almost above all things. And yet, here he is, essentially paid a full-time salary to do nothing but create research. <laughs> and so, uh, in a way, I do envy him. Um, and so, uh, for the last, uh, he, he was a visiting professor at the University of Warsaw for a while, and now he's at Brutzwoff. Um, and uh, Brutzwoff is a co-sponsor of our conference this year, uh, as is the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Warsaw and Southern Illinois University of Harvindale. All right, that said, I am now going to turn it over to Eli for his paper, and he is going to take the conference from here. Sounds good, and thank you for that lovely introduction, Randy. Um, from here, uh, before I start on my paper, I've been tasked with, for those of you who weren't there yesterday, to kind of tie in some of the themes that uh, emerged, especially in the discussion afterwards, to what we're doing today. Well, in our first attempt to emerge it, we were originally, I proposed that uh, the essays yesterday, uh, Professor Rudolf McCreel, Professor Sophia Roshinska, and Professor Beshemiswaz Burstika, all had essays that maybe had some historic legacies from idealism in some aspects. But then Professor Roshinska threw us a challenge of, well, if that's all that's connecting us, why are we here? We kind of had some heterogeneous questions off uh, essays that were seemingly very different. And Professor Burstika came up with an interesting hypothesis, which is that all of them share a commitment to cultural pluralism and keeping the sensitivity to different contexts and they, what they reveal about the world we're in and who we are. And particularly making sure we don't close down into narrow ideological, shall we say, nationalist, populist, national socialist attitudes that uh, close other horizons of meaning and other ways of living and uh, foreclose our ability to be attentive to what those lessons give us, whether that's from the arts, from philosophy itself, um, or otherwise. A, a third theme, though, emerged from that, which is, I think, a more difficult one, which is all three essays suggest something about how to be attentive to our problems hermeneutically, to recontextualize and see with new insight the world in front of us. But uh, to open that space and to be open to the other that way uh, might inevitably lead to some uncomfortable conflicts with people who refuse that orientation. So we kind of had an open question about whether advocating for this is enough and whether inevitably that will lead to tension with, you know, I don't know, kind of growing emergent fascist tendencies in the world, especially during a time of ecological crisis amongst a number of other forces. So the connecting thread today, as I see it, 
is that I think the essays today uh, will in some ways try to answer what it would actually look like in practice to try to advocate and defend this kind of pluralism in a creative, dynamic, and revitalizing way. Um, another theme that will emerge is I think a continuation of just what's the relationship of philosophy, culture, and creativity, which we will continue as well today. Uh, so with that said, I'm gonna dive in to my own piece. Um, uh, it's a quite a long one. So like uh, Professor Burstica, I'm gonna kind of cut around some sections and I'll tell you when I'm doing it uh, intentionally so that if you're curious about learning more, I can provide you some resources uh, to discuss that. So with that said, today I wanna talk about what I'm gonna call uh, the creative virtues of philosophy of culture. And in particularly in uh, what I'm going to, I like to think of as a pretty strange mode, which is a memorial to memorials, or in a way, an ode to a certain kind of hagiography that I actually think is helpful for drawing insight about how to live a broad and thoughtful philosophical life. Uh, with that said, to begin, preface, finding equanimity in the philosophy of culture. Following Ernst Cassier in his concept of philosophy as a philosophical problem, we might classify two distinct aspects of the philosophy of culture. On one hand, its task to scholastically reflect and systematically account for the endless and ever developing dimensions and limits of culture. And on the other hand, its task to orient us in and to the world, philosophically lived, efficacious and meaningful. One might wonder if these aspects are interrelated or if philosophy of culture is always of two kinds. If the latter situation is the case, are we not doomed to be lopsided? Is philosophy of culture either theoretically sophisticated but empty of value on one side and practically meaningful to the world but prosaic and narrow on the other? Its sister, the philosophy of education, has also had to address these aspects with a deepening concern that the divide has become ever wider. This divide is both a perennial problem and especially present in our own moment of cultural crisis. How is philosophy of culture going to respond to the growing power of authoritarian populist leaders and movements, the deepening systematic oppression and violence against minority communities and the widening ecological crisis? Meanwhile, how is philosophy of culture going to systematically keep track of the exponentially ever-growing and diversify, uh, diversifying horizons of meaning, symbolic forms, and modes of mediating the world, including those manifesting out of the rapid changes in the sciences and technology? These questions ought to be ever-present in our work. Uh, one of the primary reasons I was drawn to the philosophy of culture was because of its concern with the perennial problem of balancing these aspects of philosophy and creatively doing so. And because, as Kassir made clear in his own work, of its self-given imperative to respond to present challenges. Finding equanimity between these two aspects is especially important to the philosophy of culture because the gap between living culture and philosophical refraction is ever present in its work. But how do we approach such a serious and perennial challenge? While acknowledging that good perennial problems are often efficacious for us just because they can never be exhausted by reflection, I would like us to approach this theme by taking a step back and considering what virtues are modeled and even cultivated, cultivated by exemplary philosophy of culture practice. I would like to suggest that even in the scholastic aspect of this work, certain ways of living are privileged, maintained, and developed, which could be symbolized as kinds of virtues. Perhaps with these virtue symbols as pulsars and keep it afloat between its different aspects. As I will soon explain, I find such virtue symbols are not the sort of tool that can guide us directly, but only indirectly by showing us rich visions that incite us to reflection and lure and exhort us to how we might want to live the good life. A virtue symbol for me is a special kind of topic, the discussion of which is an art, an ars topica. You can think of it as a topic of conversation, like subjects such as the secrets of nature or romantic love. In this case, what I'm calling virtue symbols are topics emerging from the characters of those we admire that inspire us to live a good life. 
by considering these virtue symbols as drawn from the lives of exemplary uh, philosophers of culture. I am not advocating that what philosophy of culture needs is a set of virtues to guide it. I am suggesting that by looking at the character of a philosopher of culture, instead of making another theory, we might gain insight as to how we can navigate those worldly and scholastic aspects of this philosophical tradition. In short, these virtues are not prescriptions for life, but rather compass points to orient and spur on our practice. My postulate for our investigation here is that perhaps the lives of the philosophers can help us shape our metaphilosophical approach. As was a common notion in antiquity, to fully appreciate a philosophy, one ought to not only look at the discourse of the philosophers, but how their work bear fruits in their lives, community, and work. Of course, finding the fruit is a process of abstraction itself, but at least then we are talking, uh, uh, taking our pragmatic maxim seriously. We are seeing if the consequences of our conceptions do make a difference that makes a difference. In our case, our conceptions are virtue symbols drawn from the lives of the philosophers. So in this presentation, using Ernst Cassir as a sage model, we explore three uh, virtue symbols that I think can be drawn from his exemplary philosophy of culture practice, what I call polyhistoria, humanitas, and fusiophilia. Apologies for my butchering of the Latin for my own uh, creative purposes here. Further, I will propose that we take up these virtue symbols for philosophy of culture broadly construed. Uh, in the first section of the presentation, we explore how we can draw with due caution virtue symbols from the hagiography of uh, memorials. Unfortunately, that section, I'm only gonna give you a, a, just a, a paragraph description of what I do there. It's a much longer uh, part of the work. And, and um, in the next sections, we contemplate the aforementioned virtues. In the final section, we reflect on what these virtual symbols mean for finding equanimity between the different aspects of philosophy of culture and how they might educate us on how to respond to our situation today. Um, so I am only gonna give you uh, the concluding paragraph of my section on what I mean by a virtue symbol. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, I'm happy to send it. I just want to give you really at least an outline of uh, what I mean by a virtual symbol and how you can draw it from the kind of hagiography we find uh, in memorials to uh, uh, people we care deeply about and particularly professors. So uh, this is a concluding paragraph to that uh, whole section. Virtue symbols are drawn from an honoree's personhood. They are abstracted excellences of a person's character. These parts of a person's character are solidified as one matures as a person. We all tend to become character, caricatures of ourselves as we become older. It is not just that our personalities solidify, become less flexible, uh, flexible and deepen, but that by the very process, aspects of our character become ever more intuitable to others, albeit in even more extreme forms. These exaggerated traits, uh, both because of the age of the exemplar and because of our abstraction of those traits from the thick description of memorial discourse, we deem morally valuable, excellent, and become virtue symbols. They have gone through the solidification of personality, which is more easily intuited by others, and which are then separated from the rest of a person's character by others, even more abstract, and used as a special kind of symbol. In turn, these virtue symbols become a reference of abstracted aspects of someone's personhood, uh, what has been deemed best and most valuable in them. Uh, uh, personalist virtue symbols are of admirable characteristics of a person. They are, are, they are of course, not the person in all their tensions, including between their philosophical discourse and their lived philosophy. Uh, I realize that's quite packed, but... Uh, for those interested, again, I'll give some more information another time. I'm also go, uh, skipping a section about the limit of our investigation, about what you can and can't draw from kind of memorials uh, to particularly philosophy professors as a kind of aspect of the lives of the philosophers. So a proposal. Plus today, I have a very limited proposal for us. I ask you to explore with me the emergent uh, virtues of one philosopher of culture. We will investigate the virtues of the Dr. Wasser of philosophy of culture, Ernst Cassir. 
even in this endeavor, I will have to strictly limit myself. There is, for example, a lovely and unfortunately yet to be translated work by his wife, Toni Kassir, Mein Leben mit Ernst Kassir, which could be a great resource for more in-depth analysis of Kassir's character. However, as we know, we are not doing biography or ethnography here. We need to see him in the light of those who had less insight into his more complex human person, but cared deeply about illuminating his philosophical character. Uh, but why choose Kassir as the person at the center of our inquiry? We, of course, recognize that Kassir was all too human, though there seems to be a general consensus that he was a mensch at the very least. That said, not only was he instrumental in the development of philosophy of culture, but the respect, devotion, and love for his philosophical friends, colleagues, and students was vast and deep. These relationships provide a very rich soil for just the sort of memorials we need for our investigation. Kassir makes the job of this inquiry easier because of who he was as a person. Given his status as a figure and as a person, the virtue symbols illuminated by Kassir as a symbolized tableau of this personhood perhaps are in a better position to be treated as potential general types. I say this not as a dogmatic claim, but to suggest that his philosophical character was so strongly illuminated in his career that he provides right fruit to taste uh, what the virtues of philosophy of culture could be. Thus, we endeavor to explore Kassir as a potential sage model for philosophy of culture. Uh, we might then see our project as an attempt at a metanoia for philosophy of culture as a way of life. We are building on what Foucault called drawing on Hado and aesthetics of existence, though that itself is too limiting of a framework. Foucault thought that the ancient approach to luring others to different richer modes of ethics by exemplifying an aesthetics of living in practice and in writing showed a possible alternative to modern totalizing ethics. Building on the insights of Foucault and Aldo, we are seeking to find an image to convert ourselves to a balanced approach to philosophy of culture as a way of life. We are not interested in a totalizing philosophical anthropology of the nature of the philosopher of culture. Uh, to find the point of conversation, we explore the memorials of his colleagues and students in his Library of Living Philosophers volume. These volumes are awarded to senior philosophers. The awardees are requested to write a short autobiography, and their colleagues and critics write essays about their work. The honored philosopher gives responses in turn. After Kassir's sudden death in 1945, this usual structure was unfortunately not possible. In replacement of his autobiography, his longtime student and colleague Dmitry Govonsky wrote an in introductory essay. In addition, several speeches from his memorial service held in New York and one other memorial essay was published as addendums to the introduction. These will be used as the basis for our investigation. Uh, so now we dig into the virtues themselves. Uh, we're gonna begin with polyhistoria, uh, what I call an individuating creative virtue. To anyone who has ever skimmed lightly over a work of Ernst Cassier's, it ought to come as no surprise that his colleagues, friends, and students saw him as a masterful example of a polyhistor, a uh, polymath. With his prodigious memory, being able to quote a variety of passages from great uh, cultural figures verbatim, his love of the arts, for example, reading all of Shakespeare's works that he could get his hands on in his late youth, and his devotion to the sciences, reading and writing on its history and discussing its advances with leaders in its various fields. No one seems as well versed in so many different horizons of meaning than Ernst Cassir. The root of his prodigious memory, love of the arts and vast area of scientific expertise was not found in his masterful analytic reasoning, according to student, friend and colleague, Dmitry Govronsky, but rather in his exact sensory imagination. That's a, a quote from him. And this is the longer quote, quote, Kassir liked to tell the following story. Once he met the great mathematician Hilbert, the Euclid of our time, and asked him about one of the latter's disciples. Uh, um, Hilbert answered, he is all right, you know, for a mathematician, he did not have enough imagination, but he has become a poet and now he's doing fine. Kassir always heartily laughed when he told this story. And he had good reason for doing so, uh, but a reason of which he was never aware. He had enough imagination to become a true scholar and philosopher. 
His mental associations were amazingly rich, colorful, and always quite exact. He possessed in high degree the gift which Goethe called imagination for the truth of reality or exact sensory imagination. However keen and daring his thinking was, it always remained measured, objective, and realistic." End quote. In Gravonsky's account, Kassir's powerful imagination, the driver of his philosophy of symbolic forms as a fourth critique of imagination, gave him the ability to be sensitive to the sensory ground of meaning in the varieties of objects of knowledge of our different sense-making horizons. Kassir had an exacting recognition and attentively studied, supported, and creatively advanced the horizons of meaning and cultural life. In short, he kept accurately imagining himself into the different dimensions of reality, dimensions lesser imagination struggled to break into and inhabit. Kravonsky's point is well illuminated in Kassir's story. It is not that the poet is less imaginative than the mathematician, whatever that would mean but that without guidance of deep imagination, mathematics and the sciences are all too easily trapped in model centrism, in a closed-minded, dogmatic and reactionary attitude. A great imagination is needed in to enter into whole new approaches to the organization of relations, possible and actual. Such a, a powerful imagination is exactingly accurate in its ability to understand how humanity draws from the materials of the manifold of sense, ever new and productive modes of sense making. In Kassir's case, he was able to enter the life world of historical figures and problems and from them find new insights, relations and dimensions of culture previously missed. In turn, what incited it was not a joy for precision, but a genuine, unquenchable, and passionate curiosity. One of his later students at Columbia University, Edward Case, memorialized this feature of Kassir's character through a particularly hyperbolic anecdote. Quote, he was an ardent man. I understood this on the day of the last class he taught. I was on my way to the class that day, when in the distance, I was glad to see Professor Kassir walking in the same direction. I quickened my pace in order to catch up with him. When I came closer, I saw that, as he walked, he was reading a book, which absorption accounted for the slowness of his step. As I watched him, he paused to concentrate on what he was reading, and, in that moment, I perceived that Ernst Kassir, at the age of 70, was more ardently interested in the contents of that book than most young men have ever been interested in the contents of any book." End quote. The exaggerated story reveals a striking feature of how others respond to the Kassir's polyhistoria. It provided wonder at the depth and breadth of a person's curiosity, passion, and knowledge. Kassir became devoted to a uh, case, excuse me, became devoted to him, as many students do with their mentors. And in fact, as Kassir did with Herman Cohen, because of the inciting power of someone with such a poly, uh, poly dimension uh, dimensionality and depth. Polyhistoria incite others to become well read, to become, if not polymaths, culture, in the sense of humanitas that we discussed shortly. Such a virtue always runs the risk of promoting bookishness and isolation, of not living in the present fully. Kassir was never a socialite, and although kind and supportive to others, his individual life would uh, become ever richer and more dominant over his character. This process strongly individuated him and thus helped him become a genuine individual. He broke from other modes of being and became an iconoclast. It was for this reason that even as a student, his uh, circle of fellow Cohenites used to refer to him as, quote, the Olympian, both for his unhuman breadth and depth of knowledge and for his distance from the regular events and affairs of being a student in the social world of Marburg. This kind of individuation requires a special mode of enquiteia, of mastery of oneself. To some, this might seem like narrowness of spirit, as the former director of the Warburg Library at Saxo put it. Uh, quote, only much later did I understand that the reason was not narrowness, but self-restraint. Those who knew Kassir will realize that the decision to keep aloof from certain problems at a certain moment was dictated by the austere logic of his own method. End quote. Kassir wanted to be an expansive, uh, as expansive a polymath as he could, and he was patient, diligent, and organized enough to learn certain questions 
thematics, and even social activities come in their due time and place. More importantly, he knew that to serve others as a polyhistor, he must become a special kind of individual. It is this insight that a special kind of deep individuality cultivated through broad learning is needed to incite wonder in others that better illuminates his willingness to narrow some parts of his social life only to expand it in other ways. Quote, he eagerly performed his duties as academic teacher, gave weekly several lectures and seminars, and was most accessible to any student who desired uh, his help on philosophical problems. Despite this immense amount of intellectual work which Kassir performed day after day, there was nothing of the ivory tower pedant in him. He spent almost every evening in the circle of his family and of his friends, and he showed a lively interest in all world events. It was amazing to what degree he was able to keep abreast of so many things which had no relation whatsoever to his scientific work. He was a thorough connoisseur uh, of classical music, and in the classical operas, he knew not only every single melody, but also every word of the text, often even in several different languages. He knew a great deal about many fields of sport and was able to discuss some intricate problems of uh, 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 passants or scat. He was even interested in the most impersonal manner in stock exchange prices and tried to understand what was hidden behind their seemingly grotesque and unpredictable movement." End quote. Thus, this individuality actually ended up serving Kassir in cultivating meaningful relationships. It did so by supporting him and being the kind of person who is both genuinely interested in others' passions and interests and knew, who knows something about those passions and interests. People yearn for someone who is excited about their own horizon of activity, and there is nothing like the curiosity and expertise of the polyhistor to open up dialogue. He certainly did his polyhistoric work in his own standoffish and iconoclastic way, but through his individuality, he became a leader who incited wonder and ambition in others who wanted to match him or create a deep connection with those who felt appreciated and seen by his sensitive interest in them. This kind of individuality can thus serve a broader engagement with cultural life. Uh, even as a student, he was the center of a philosophical community, the Marburg Neo-Kantian School of Philosophy. He in fact lived in a house which became the literal physical center of the movement, at least among Cohen students. He would continue to create such communities with his polyhistoric gravity as he traveled across Europe and North America, fleeing Nazi Germany. As he said of his own journey, quote, looking back on my long academic life, I must regard it as a long odyssey. It was a sort of pilgrimage that led me from one university to the other, from one country to the other, and at the end, from one hemisphere to the other. This odyssey was rich in experiences, in human and intellectual adventures. What was most delightful and gratifying in this long academic journey was the fact that it became also, more and more, a sentimental journey. For at any new place, I was lucky enough to find new friends. I found colleagues who were ready to help me in my work, and I found students who were interested in my philosophical views." End quote. His polymatic personality lured other people to the life of uh, cultural cultivation, and he created communities of higher learning wherever he went. It is an adventure both in geography, but also in human interaction, and opening up new horizons of meaning and life worlds for fellow travelers. It is this vision of the life of the philosopher of culture as open, growing, and ever enriching that his colleague Henrik Poss thought most distinguished him from Martin Heidegger at their famous Davos meeting. Quote, the difference was clear. Heidegger persisted in the terminus a quo in the situation at the point of departure, which for him is the dominating factor in all philosophizing. Kassir, on the other hand, aimed at the terminus ad quem, at liberation through the spiritual form in science, practical activity, and art, end quote. In its deepest sense, Kassirian polyhistoria is the virtue of self-liberation, of transcending, not as an independent activity, but as one shared with others that deepens one's own dimensions of personality. It helps you become a unique person and in turn incite others to their own individuation via polyhistoric philosophy. As his friend and lifelong promoter, Charles W. Hendel so astutely pointed out, quote, 
He was a philosopher who brings to birth the philosophic spirit and way of life in those who lived and worked with him, end quote. He lured others to the wonder of the philosophical life with the gravity of his polyhistoria. Further, as we shall see, this polyhistoric self-cultivation with others supports an attentive care for the other horizons of meaning in both communities and individual persons. This refined attentiveness is what I call humanitas. Humanitas, a bildung virtue. We all too often forget that to be cultured in its historic sense from philanthropia, also in the virtue of Ren, as developed in the Confucian tradition, is not centered around the, uh, the amount of diverse knowledge and skills one has accumulated. To be cultured at its root is not centered around the impressive reservoir of the polyhistoric themselves. Rather, humanitas is a growth in oneself of a personal world of meaning through the reflective kind care for the life worlds of others, which incites and guides one's engagement with their horizons of meaning and allows one to be attentive to their full personhood. Yet, those of us in the arts and humanities are always told that polyhistoria is somehow supposed to cultivate this kind of philanthropic, the classical sense of the term, attentiveness. What then is the relationship between polyhistoria and humanitas? We return to Kassir's memorials for insight. Pass was struck by Kassir's humanitas and had his own analysis of its root. Quote, one scarcely knows what to marvel at most, this man's gigantic intellect, his consummate form of expression or his chivalrous humanity. His philosophy reveals his character through its capacity for transposing itself sympathetically into various and sundry philosophical viewpoints without thereby losing the distinctive lines of his own thinking. In this context, what I think Poss wants to suggest by saying that his quote, philosophy reveals his character, end quote, is that his quote, gigantic intellect, end quote, consummate form of uh, expression are inextricably intertwined with his, uh, quote, chivalrous humanity and are all revealed in the very way in which he practiced philosophy. The opposite must thus be said just as clearly. His character reveals his philosophy, his ability to use his sensuously exacting imagination to effectively enter the rise in the meanings of others and to apprehend the dynamic dialectics of their work is a kind of care and sensitivity to the genuine reality of others. He treated other persons in the horizons of meaning as real and from real people and not as mere symbols of persons as tropes. Further, he was able to do so while not losing himself because of his firm anchor in his own individuated character. Polyhistoria affords one a sensitivity to others as full persons and anchors one in oneself. This anchoring in an iconoclastic individuation not only serves being sensitive and caring to others without drawing oneself, uh, 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 draining oneself, excuse me, but it also, as we shall see, is a source of strength for others. Recognition from another who is grounded in themselves can help one find one's own way as a sort of lighthouse in the fog of life. His colleague, uh, Hayo Holborn, was firmly convinced that it was humanitas that was Kassir's greatest strength as a teacher. Quote, his capacity to project himself in the, into the psychological and mental environment of a past age or of an individual sinker of the past did not make him forget the individual needs of a present day audience or student. His understanding of human nature made him take his listeners or pupils as seriously as the philosophical and historical subjects he tried to expound upon. These qualities explain his success as a teacher in Germany, in Sweden, and in America." End quote. Humanitas, as Holborn articulates it in his own way, is the virtue symbol of a great teacher, not merely of the historian entering the life world of those past, but as an attentive mentor of living persons. Gavronsky expressed this mentorship directly as Kassir was perhaps the most formative teacher in his life. Reminiscing fondly on their relationship, he noted, quote, especially popular were Kassir's seminars. There, in close contact with his students, he displayed all the charm and benevolence of his nature. He analyzed with endless patience and sympathetic understanding 
an expressed opinion and, if necessary, cautiously corrected it or interpreted it in the most fruitful possible way. He was a true uh, pedagogos in the platonic sense, deeply convinced that the teacher is largely to blame for the insufficiencies of his pupil, end quote. Kassir did not think that the shortcomings of the student were his responsibility because a philosopher of culture teacher must always have a perfect pedagogy, but in the sense that a pedagogos ought to be sensitive enough to apprehend the student where they are, their interests, passions, and blindnesses. If they cannot serve recognizing and supporting them now, it is because they have not fully entered their student's life world and found a way to be sympathetic to it. Students, of course, have to have some responsibility for their actions, but a philosopher of culture as pedagogos sees it as an imperative to do their best to attend, recognize, connect, support, and advance the deepest engagement with the dimension of the life of the student as they are and facilitate their growth from there. Uh, this point is not so far off from John Dewey's view in democracy and education. Embedded in polyhistoria and as made explicit in humanitas, is this imperative to recognize the student as a present person, growing and capable of refined growth. The teacher's task is to find the way to, like Socrates, incite the, that growth in whatever way they can do so. Kassir was seemingly adept at such work. This imaginative attention to the life world of others allowed the European trained Kassir to adapt to the more informal American higher education classroom. Quote, but the methods of academic teaching in America are quite different from those of Europe. The cooperation between students and professors is much closer and more informal here than in Europe. Kassir not only adapted himself willingly and easily to these different ways of teaching, he sincerely liked and greatly appreciated them. He often said that to work together with a group of eager students who recognized no authority other than truth itself and kept questioning their teachers until they were entirely and thoroughly satisfied was to him a new and most fruitful experience, end quote. In fact, students that are more open and critical in the classroom are easier to authentically learn from and engage with in their own growth and meaning making. The formal rituals of the passive classroom anywhere in the world inhibit the work of humanitas. Humanitas was, however, more than just a pedagogy for Kassir. He was committed to the project of knowledge, i.e. higher learning, as a communal endeavor. In his view, humanitas is a pedagogy, therapia, and epistemology that refine our communities of inquiry. Quote, Goethe's assertion that only mankind as a whole is able to find the truth was part of Kassir's very nature and made him largely oblivious to the uniqueness of many of his own deepest insights and significant contributions. It was this trait of Kassir's mental attitude which made him so tolerant in all spiritual things and so appreciative of all earnest and sincere striving. His deep conviction that truth is immensely beyond that of any one individual mind never permitted him to discard any opinion without thorough investigation, end quote. Only through humanitas as the altruistic recognition and support of other perspectives, we have any chance of coming to mature truth of the progress of knowledge as an organic process. In the tradition of Kant and Wilhelm von Humboldt, Kassir considered the progress of knowledge as one and the same as the recognition and support of other persons. Only through the flourishing of all persons do we have the perspectives needed to make synoptic speculations about the functional whole of culture that underlies its uh, infinitely diverse particular routes, the task of this kind of neo-Kantian critical philosophy. Kassir was a synoptic pluralist in his naturalized approach to the maturation of knowledge, and he was committed to a vision of higher learning that recognized and supported diversity, because only through it can we gain insight into the truth of ourselves and our place in the universe. He thus gave a far richer sense to the function of the project of knowledge than we tend to give it today. Our concept is quite parched in comparison. The, the epistemic value of pluralism is not only between members of a seminar or between diverse theorists at any moment in the history of higher learning. It is also, of course, between the generations. For this reason, Kassir appreciated the general conflict that is part of the growth of this quest. Kassir put it the following way, quote, the to the struggle between philosophers, there was added the struggle between the generations. In many of our modern systems of education, 
We are told that it's hopeless to reconcile the views of men belonging to different generations. We are told that there is a deep and instrumental gap between the generations, that every new generation must feel in its own way, think its own thoughts, and speak its own language. I regard this as a misleading and dangerous dogma, and as a dogma that throughout my life I found constantly contra contradicted by my own personal experience. The older I grow, so much the more I become interested in the work and thoughts of the younger men. And I always found that they readily answered to my interests. Of course, the younger people criticize me sometimes rather severely. They could not always agree with me. They thought perhaps that they had outgrown a long time ago uh, some of the philosophic ideas and ideals that were still very dear to me. But after all, they listened to me and they tolerated me, uh, uh, my very old fashioned philosophy. They could see my point as well as I could see theirs." End quote. Here we find Kassir's humanitas in another of its aspects. He appreciated and was attentive to the views of younger generations, even if they were often harshly critical of him and treated him as a naive liberal of a previous generation, just because their views had real insight, as had his own, and only through their work together would the dialectics of culture move forward. Perhaps the most uh, significant example of the relationship he uh, illustrated between the progress of knowledge and the altruistic cultivation and nurturing of persons can be seen in an event that took place in 1921. Before this event, Abby Warburg, the founder of the Warburg Institute, devoted the interrelated study of the origins of philosophy and science in mythic consciousness, magic, theosophy, poetry, and the arts, was hospitalized in a mental clinic in Switzerland for symptoms of manic depression and schizophrenia. Kassir was at this time developing a close relationship with the library as it was almost as if by magic, structured perfectly for his research project on the symbolic form of myth. Warburg was devastated by his mental health and was afraid that he had lost his mind for good. It is at this moment that Saxel tells one of the most profound stories that make up the hagiography of Kassir's memorials published in his LLP volume. Quote, one day, Kassir went to Switzerland to pay a visit to Warburg. It was a meeting of which both Kassir and Warburg often spoke in later years. The patient had prepared himself for this day for weeks and months previously. Kassir came full of sympathy and with the apprehension and awe that mental illness inspires. In the years of anguish and isolation, Warburg's thought, which had never been arrested by the illness, had uh, centered around Kepler. Warburg had come to the conclusion, although separated from all books, that modern thought was born when Kepler broke the traditional supremacy of the circle as the ideal form in cosmological thought and replaced it by the ellipses. Kassir, who never took note, but the, uh, possessed a memory of almost unlimited capacity, at once came to Warburg's aid, giving chapter and verse for his idea by quoting from Kepler. It was probably Warburg's first ray of light in those dark years. He learned through Kassir that he had not wandered in a pathless wilderness, but that his scientific thought at least was sane. Kassir's memory was always miraculous, but it had never worked as miraculous a cure as it did on that day." End quote. We might add that not only was Kassir's memory as polyhistoria, but more importantly, his humanitas recognition of Warburg's personal experience and not as reduced to a Foucauldian deviant type that was part of, uh, that was both a therapy for Warburg as a person and epistemic support for the growth of Warburg's unique insights. Humanitas as the nutrients of the building of culture is both personal, moral cultivation and epistemic maturation. It is the end which polyhistoria serves and the means by which it is further cultivated. Uh, last, fusiophilia a religious virtue. Kassir's humanitas and polyhistoria, despite their gravity, do not fully account for why others were so drawn to him. There was yet another emergent aspect of his character that was illuminated to his philosophical friends, colleagues, and students. Handel has well articulated this something more to what was so wonderful about being around Kassir. Quote, again, it was good for one's soul to be with him. And no one who knew him at all could miss the cheerfulness with which 
which was a sort of spiritual radiance that warmed and brightened our fellowship. End quote. This cheerful spiritual radiance was coupled to a sort of light serenity that a student case found remarkable. Quote, and yet Ernst Kassir was a man whose presence bespoke serenity as surely as do the green leaves bespeak the springtime. Serenity of countenance and mind was noted by all, but it was not the serenity which is unconscious of the storm. It was rather a kind of winged serenity which surveyed, which comprehended, and yet which nobly overrode the storm." End quote. Kassir was aware of and explored extensively the darker aspects of cultural life, fortifyingly revealed by both world wars in the 20th century. Yet such an awareness did not ever stop him from having a certain lightness of being, kind of merry wisdom. Most European philosophers, never mind Jewish ones, who survived the wars, brooded in thoughtful engagements with one's own most possibilities and freedoms as a human being in a world where human life could be all too monstrous. Was Kassir merely naive and blind to the world? His colleagues, friends, and students did not think that was the case. So where did this source of lighthearted peace come from that made him good for the souls around him in such a dark time? His Dutch colleague, Poss, had a keen eye for the relation of Kassir's systematic philosophy to the world. It is to this keen insight that we must turn again in order to guide us. Quote, Kassir's philosophy of culture is probably a uh, philosophy of culture is a philosophy of the logos, not in the narrow sense of ratio or of the intellect in the purely theoretical sense, but rather in the sense of the spiritual form-inducing energy, which appears in science, society, and art, end quote. It is this spiritual form-inducing energy that Kassir was so, insensitive, uh, was so sensitive to in its dynamic development and cultural life. Indeed, when he surveyed his own philosophy, he too centered his spiritual forming and reforming of cultural life as its vital continuity. And now I'm going to read this famous quote uh, from the philosophy of symbolic forms, quote, just as scholastic metaphysics coined the concepts of natura naturata and uh, natura naturans, so the philosophy of symbolic forms must distinguish between forma formans and forma formata. The interplay between both is what constitutes the swing of the pendulum of intellectual life itself. The forma formand that becomes forma formata, which it must uh, become for the sake of its own self-preservation without ever becoming reduced to it, retains the power to regain itself from it, to be born again as a forma formans. This is what is distinctive of the development of Geist and culture, end quote. To see here, through this Hegelian insight, saw a movement between systol and diastol, between settled symbolic culture and its reconstruction through the activity of Geist as the beating heart of reality. By taking a view from above, one can see this very swing of the pendulum between forma formans, form as forming, that is, becoming, and forma format, form as form, that is, a settled symbolic network, as a continuity between all our diverse activities and products. As Kassir articulated this point in his philosophy of symbolic form. If the philosophy of quote, if the philosophy of culture succeeds in apprehending and elucidating such basic principles, it will have fulfilled, in a new sense, its task of demonstrating the unity of the spirit, as opposed to the multiplicity of its manifestations. For the clearest evidence of this unity is precisely the diversity of the products of the human spirit, which does not impair the unity of its productive process but rather sustains and confirms it, end quote. The unity is in our reconstructive strivings, not their diverse products, but only in those diverse products will the unity of our dynamic activity be illuminated. Thus, Kassir developed a philosophy of culture program to help illuminate the spiritual unity of cultural life. Quote, in Kassir's personality and work, Goethe's program of education became a living reality again. The total of Western civilization was to be constructed and made a part of the consciousness of the modern individual and of present day civilization. The study of the processes and creations of civilization would lift the individual to a position from which he would see farther than from day to day and could begin to grasp the ideal forms and categories of the human mind." End quote. We might add that perhaps for Kassir, 
given his own work in intercultural philosophy, quite limited in this day and age, that this project was meant ultimately to be a kind of, to be global in scale and not just of the West. Certainly we ought to be so global today. Further, this educational task, this task of contemplation for the philosopher of culture was not merely a scholastic exercise as Holborn insightfully argues, quote, but as closely as his historical and philosophical studies were intertwined, the unity of his many interests to be found in the philosophical conviction that man can participate in a higher order of life through the realization of the perennial forms of human thought, end quote. We can now begin to understand Kassir's religion, or if that word is too bothersome, if he's fair, Kassir was a fairly secular person, his spirituality, the source of his lighthearted beneficence. He found that through using the exact sensory imagination, we can survey the diversity of our products and through that process, illuminate the unity of Geist and by such contemplation, find a higher life. This higher life was felt as a deep reverence to philosophical love in the sense of the Greek philos for this dynamic activity of becoming. Gravonsky was also struck by this deep religious spiritual aspect of his approach to philosophy of culture. Quote, Kassir was a deeply religious man. He cared little for differing rites, rituals, confessions, or denominations. Those only split mankind into so many groups and often turned them against each other. Yet the very core of any true religion, the cosmic feeling, a love as wide as the universe and as intense as the light of the sun was always vivid in his heart. It was this feeling which urged Kassir incessantly to explore all material and spiritual things, which filled his heart with deep sympathy for everything good in the world, which strengthened his will to fight for this good. It was this feeling which was the source of his charming humor. The infinite all was always present in his mind and never permitted him to take either himself or his surroundings too seriously. And he was, therefore, able to joke for hours in the most spirited and sympathetic manner." End quote. And here, for the first time, we fully see the critical significance of his scholastic and world-related philosophy, philosophical way of life. They were never really separate projects. Uh, underneath all was a religious love for cosmic becoming, Geist as we experience it. And his study of it only strengthened his willingness to recognize, appreciate, and fight for it. Yet his love is for something bigger than we typically think of as philosophical cosmos and the sense of order. For it also includes the beautiful reconstructive chaos of Forma Formans as it revitalizes our meaning-making activity. Kassir's philosophy loves Rama, creation, Vishnu, preservation, and Shiva, destruction, reconstruction. For this reason, I term this expansive love, love of thusis, universal becoming. It is a fusiothelia or love of thusis in a swing from cosmic ordering to creative reconstructive chaos as the pendulum swing of cultural life. Fusiothelia is a religious appreciation of the whole powerful vital meaning of becoming both natural and cultural at the same time that one participates in. This love gives one the strength to fight for that vital cultural activity. This love allowed Kassir, as Gravonsky so astutely suggests, to hold within himself an appreciation for all finite uh, efforts at meaning making and uh, infinite empathy for those creatures finding their place in between cosmos and chaos. This virtue symbol takes what Ado has called the view from above, for which, as Michael Chase succinctly summarizes, quote, Edo argues we can achieve cosmic consciousness that raises us above the petty concerns of our individualistic lives and makes us aware that we are parts of the all. This final goal is equivalent to happiness in the sense given to this concept in the Hellenistic philosophy, freedom from anxiety, anguish, worries, and despair, end quote. In the philosophy of culture, drawing from an ancient thread of process thought as old as Heraclitus and Lao Tzu, one carries out this existential exercise through the study and contemplation of the diverse creation to vital activity so that one can ever love, better illuminate, and defend the underlying unity of this alan fatal of becoming and its capacity for vital recreation. Further, and perhaps unique to a philosophy of culture's view from above, 
This virtue brings a lightheartedness and ability to take uh, oneself with laughter as we learn. Uh, as we learn, we contribute an important but inevitably finite role in the adventure of culture. Others are needed to illuminate the story well beyond what will be our contribution. We need not take ourselves so seriously, for we can see that we are also perennial Dickensian like absurd, forgivable creatures. It provides a solace for ourselves and those around us to know we do not need to be trapped in our finite perspective, and we can follow the endless diverse historical threads of the tragic comic songs of a person with the lightness of being. It is perhaps this lighthearted, tragic, perennial wisdom coupled with seriousness of study and attentiveness to others that guides philosophers of culture to leadership role. Paradoxically, the way of life of the Renaissance sage that the virtual symbols of Kisir uh, illuminate is a life of both solitude and leadership. Um, and I think I have three pages left, so I should be able to get that in five minutes, and I think we'll be on track. So the Renaissance sage, the exemplary philosopher of culture. These virtues coordinate in a perennial vision best viewed in the tradition of humanists such as Voltaire, Diderot, and in our day, Umberto Eco. To build from the trope, we articulate this vision of a cultured, attentive, loving polyhistor who creates community wherever they go as the Renaissance person. We should not forget that even older role models of this type, such as, uh, uh, such as can be seen in the life and work of Leibniz, played many roles in their lives. Uh, in his case, as a historian and diplomat central to peace treaties, they become leaders of communities and movements, even if just in the Republic of Letters. So too did Kassir, as Gravonsky highlighted. Quote, this great versatility proved to be a real blessing to Kassir when, in 1930, he was elected rector of the University of Hamburg. Now he had to represent the university at various academic functions and to make speeches on literally every type of subject. One day he spoke on the developments of modern traffic, another day on the breedings of hogs, then again on the importance of athletic sports. And the most amazing part of it was that the scope of his understanding and the wealth of his knowledge were so vast that whatever subject he touched upon, he was able to illuminate its different aspects and to show its true place in the whole of cultural life, end quote. It is this lived synoptic pluralism of the philosopher of culture that makes them uniquely suited then to a particular role, that of leaders of communities and institutions of higher learning. They can, at the theoretical and personal level, be attentive to different disciplines and persons, understanding and addressing their needs and interests, while holding, through an existential exercise, a non-reductive vision of the unity that they all participate in as a guiding vision for their community of higher learning. It is his success as theorist, live philosopher, teacher, therapist, and leader of a community of higher learning that makes Kassir in, this, uh, in these abstracted and coordinated virtues become a symbol of the Renaissance person. Quote, the name of Kassir actually symbolized a universalism and internationalism, which recognizes every a member of mankind for its spiritual contribution to the whole cultural pattern. On the presupposition that through each uh, mutual recognition, the unity of mankind will be honored and promoted." End quote. Conclusion, the Renaissance person in dark times. While the virtue symbols of polyhistoria, humanitas, and thusiophilia seem meritorious, one often wonders if Kassir's critical American students did not mark out something that ought to trouble us in his character. Is Kassir not the quintessential, well-intentioned, but ultimately dangerously naive liberal of the 20th century? Did, he not, uh, uh, did not he and his colleagues turn a blind eye to colonial genocide and the sources of nationalistic populism? Did not Kassir himself admit as much about himself and his work addressing fascism, the myth of the state? Ought we not to follow the, the dominant trend in post-war philosophy, promoting a vision of the philosophical sage as a finite creature who must find authenticity in the lost world they were thrown into? Or alternatively, maybe we need to accept ourselves as an endless discursive project that has an ever uh, transforming subject, one that is perhaps no longer human, and that we uh, certainly ought not to treat with a hermeneutics, or that we certainly ought to treat with a hermeneutics of suspicion. Without rejecting the need for any of these routes, 
one ought to remember that although Kassir was limited in his own ways, he was certainly never naive about the dangers of cultural life. He did, after all, leave Germany early in the 1930s, and was already at the time writing on the dangers of the Nazis and the duties of philosophy to respond. Even those well prepared for the Second World War, never mind the first, from Sartre to Camus to Arendt and Benjamin, were all devastated by the experience of it. How could one not be? We might all hear for the optimism that the sciences are a progressive symbolic form as Randall Ochter and others have done. But I think we certainly can still place our hopes in our meaning making, both stable and creative, even if not in the sciences by themselves as the source of cultural vitality. Kassir, not as limited thinker in person, but as an image of the sage, a symbol, is actually all the more pertinent in dark times. We today have a zeitgeist of doom and gloom in our philosophical writing, prophesizing infinite ecological collapse, rampant pandemics, with an interrelated rise in authoritarianism that threatens the survival of democratic life and governance, all while rightfully criticizing ourselves for never having fully grappled with the legacy of colonial genocide and unfettered capitalism. We also admit how lost uh, we are in ever complexifying culture. It seems impossible to stay abreast of all the changes. Kassir also lived in the darkest of times and was at the heart of the darkness often with limited resources and on the run, yet chose a way of doing philosophy that always cared for others, always defended the value of multiculturalism as the maturation of culture and knowledge, and always took a view from above that saw potential for hope in the revitalizing aspects of culture. He did so in a way that offered consolation and strength for those around him. In line with philosophers of culture like Dewey, he appreciated critical, realistic, and imaginative hope as part of the great task of philosophy of culture to still in others, no matter how complex and diversified the cultural situation. We need not keep track of every movement of culture to strive to participate in its very dimensions as a hopeful practice in personal creativity. I know I could be better about bringing such hopeful energy into my teaching. For the dark times to come, we need strength, support, hope, and a good deal of lighthearted laughter to keep us afloat and doing our duties to others while uh, meditating on the ever diversifying unified cosmic becoming. Equanimity in the philosophy of culture is then found not merely in theory, nor merely in practice, nor in some new meta philosophy, but in a Renaissance way of life that has a faith in revitalization. May the sage Kassir ever guide us to the call of the new ever perennial life. Okay, we have about 15 minutes for questions and then we'll have a bathroom break. Um, and so you can use the hand raise function if you like. Uh, I can't see all of you at once. I can only see half of you at any one time. So if you raise your hand physically, I may not see you. I, I do see John DiCarlo and I see Rudy. So we'll start with John. Thank you much, Eli. Um, a, lot, a lot of rich uh, contemplation there. Um, I'm just going to try to keep it simple. It, it seems like there's a thin line between this, the, the character or, or, or the, the virtual symbols and methodology. Um, would, you, would you just briefly uh, <clears throat> address that, how, how, they're, how they're similar and yet different in your mind? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to see if I can explain that a little bit. Part of that is in the section I skipped, of course, where like that becomes a little clearer. But what I was trying to do is, and this come up, came up in discussions about the piece, is trying to think about how we ought to treat kind of discourse we find in lives of philosopher texts from Diogenes of Laertius to more modern stuff or in memorials or in, from anecdotes from friends. So I tried to, um, how should I say it, develop a, meta, a methodology to think responsibly about what it means to draw some discourse about someone's life that they can never fully capture. Mm. And I wanted to make the case in a kind of Bergsonian spirit that sometimes um, exaggeration, like to make contrast, to see aspects of a character we couldn't otherwise is actually really useful. 
and they even make an interesting process case that actually at certain moments in life, I do think a senior scholar whose personality is really matured, there are certain aspects of that that are easier to pull out. And of course, they're not the full person. They don't capture everything, but they do capture some time. And sometimes you need this exaggerated pull to get there. Now, that, that makes a lot of limitations. So I, I try to include that in the text, some cautionary notes about what I mean by that. And to be cautionary, what I mean by, I'm not suggesting a virtue ethics here. It's more something, a kind of virtues as educated point of reflection for us to think about the kinds of persons we want to be instead of a kind of a prescriptive tool. Okay, good, thank you, that helps, appreciate it. Hey, Rudy, you're next. Okay. Yes, I have great admiration for Kassira. I studied at Columbia in the 1960s, and uh, I wanted to write my dissertation on Kassira. But there had been so many dissertations on him at Columbia that I was advised against it. So I, my thesis advisor, Albert Hofstadter, suggested I turn to, to Dilta. I wanted to write on Kassira's view on the imagination, which is a thing that I always was interested in, kind of reconstructed. And he talks about it, but not in a systematic way. And uh, so then instead I wrote about Dilta and the imagination. And Dilta has a really interesting theory. So I, I was happy that I ended up doing that, but I've always loved uh, Kassira. He got me interested in Kant and uh, I read all his volumes on the symbolic forms. And uh, so uh, also you talked about his equanimity, but apparently he died on the steps of Low Library a day or two after, I think it was a day or two after Roosevelt had died. He was so upset about that. So at maybe at the last moment, he wasn't, he didn't have that equanimity. Equanimity, yeah. He fell up uh, and he even fell into a student's arms, apparently, who was about to ask him a question. I, I feel bad for that uh, particular student, too. Could you say that? Yeah. Could you say that again? Yeah. Apparently, at that moment, he like he had the heart attack very suddenly and fell over into one of his student's arms. Oh, really? He was about to ask him a question. At least that's the story in the LLP. I didn't know that part of it. Yeah. It was on the steps of the low library, it called me. And uh, so I've written some essays about him. One of the ones that I like is uh, one that I gave in Hamburg when they celebrated an anniversary of his rectorship there. And it was part of a volume where which Habermas spoke to. And uh, it was called Kassir uh, Zwischen Kant und Diltai. <laughs> so it's kind of in between my two favorite first people. Thank yeah. you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I will add with again with that last point you made about his, uh, you know, his uh, death that part of the other reason to be careful with virtue symbols, right, is although they reveal aspects of his character, it doesn't mean he didn't get angry or frustrated yeah. or was unfair and dismissive, of course. I just mean to pull out some important aspect that, sure, you yeah. know, emerged from his career. So I see that Corey has his hand up. Yeah, so I have sort of a, a, I guess, a meta question, Eli, um, not about Kassir, but about this whole question of exemplarity itself and the ethics of exemplarity. Um, it seems that there are tensions with this notion of exemplarity that you're um, analyzing and in, in living in a democratic society. So I was wondering if you wanted to reflect on that a little bit. So, so the reason I think this is an ethical question is because it's not just which exemplars we have, but how we approach the exemplar, right? If we idolize them too much, then we might lose our ability to, to, to act and lose our agency within a democratic society, potentially in extreme sure. form. Sure, that's a, that's a good question. And they, I'll give two kind of levels to the answer. On a personal level, I'm sympathetic to the concerns, especially in kind of modern anarchist thought that, you know, leader based social movement work is deeply problematic. And, you know, obviously social activists on the ground and things like Black Lives Matter and other movements have tried to be mindful of that. 
to not get you know sucked into what they consider hero worship. Um, so on one side, I'm I'm very sympathetic to that. On the other, and just in terms of a kind of perennial practical tool, uh, it does seem across cultures it has been really helpful to articulate ideals in some sort of object, exaggerated, sometimes absurd sense. Hopefully, you know, you're in a classroom environment where you can caution people about you know hero worship. There, in fact, uh, a common solution in the ancient world, uh, Ado often talks about, is they often prepared to not describe any particular person as the sage. And just have questions about what would the sage do in X Y situation to kind of the to avoid the problem of the uh, uh, worship of a personality. Um, as for my own work, I don't know. In broader democratic life, I think I have some anxiety about you know the dangers of hero worship. I do think. Um, we in philosophy, it would probably be good for us to turn to the lives of people a little better, even if it's, you know, taking certain aspects of them to draw resources about the kind of scholars and philosophers we want to be. So I think it's, uh, it's actually a kind of narrowing reason for myself. I think in philosophy, it matters for us to do this more. Mm -hmm. But I, I think on a greater scale, it is probably problematic and needs lots of caution. But weirdly, in philosophy, we often don't do this and don't really consider the relation between a philosopher's work, especially our mentors and the kind of persons they were and what that means about who we would like to be. So I still think there are tensions there and mm -hmm. I don't have good answers. I'm struggling with them sense. myself, but yeah, that's thanks. where I'm at. To what extent, Eli, do you think your, your project, you know, you draw, the, you draw the, the circle around your project with philosophers and and of course by that you don't mean academic philosophers you mean people who are committed to living according to a philosophy and who express that philosophy I mean so your idea of a philosopher is a kind of person uh, not necessarily a professional at it but whose essential guiding principles are philosophical and that can include religious people too but to what extent does the way that you draw your circle around philosophy as a way of life, to what extent does that remove you from the politics of your day or any given day? I mean, doesn't it have that effect? So, so that's a good question. Uh, and there's a, a few layered answers to it. Let's, let's start with this text as well. I think good philosophy as a wife is both perennial and attentive to the present. You know, I think, it, you know, there's a whole group of, of public intellectuals in the 20th century who are very attentive to the present issues who lived philosophy as a way of life. So I don't, on one level, I, I, despite, well, I'll start with this. On one level, I think practically some of the best exemplars of philosophy as a way of life are deeply immersed in the politics and social tensions of their life and world. And this is even true historically of Confucius and, you know, even Diogenes of Sinope and, you know, I don't know who, uh, Luan and, and, and Han Dynasty China. These are actually people who are, even Leibniz is part of my point of bringing him right. We think of him as like, you know, classical removed rationalist, but who he saw himself as engaged and in fact was engaged in many ways with the world around him in some deeply important aspects. Um, so I think I probably you differ. To, you have to sort of be an activist to be a good philosopher is what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, and I think sometimes what people miss is just because a lot of people in philosophy as a way of life are historians of philosophy or ph philologists by discipline. They assume that means that, you know, they're always looking to the perennial aspect because they think that's most important. I, I don't even think of that was true of Hado, Hado. It's just how he came to the questions himself because of his uh, disposition and general orientation. So I don't think it's a, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's come about because of the development of the field itself, but it's certainly not endemic to what I see as interesting about philosophy as a way of life. And, you know, I would hope that it would include very activist elements and, you know, thoughtful hermits of a sort that, include, it, that it should ought to be very pluralist. And I'll just end with um, this project. It was a personal one for me of like, what does it mean for me to have an, I don't know, an active philosophy of culture role that's supposed to be a meaningful and authentic and serve people. So I think that was on my own mind writing this, this piece. Okay. I see Mark and then Ralph. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, Eli, thanks. That's a wonderful, wonderful paper, wonderful set of ideas. I couldn't help but think as, as, you, as you talked about it, because you said, <laughs> you said 
project to bring the individual beyond seeing day to day. And I couldn't help but think of it in the terms of where the world is today, thinking that the world at the speed at which things go, they go and they change. And with internet culture, the mass of information that bombards us. And so the question that came to my mind, has the world changed too much? I mean, your, your, the vision you put forward is a beautiful vision of what the best philosopher, philosophers could be at their best. But has the world changed too much to put it in practice now from what it was in the time of a Descartes, a Leibniz, or even a Kassir? What do you think? I think obviously some elements are different. And for sure, I kind of breeze over those in this piece as, you know, its own piece of philosophical discourse, right? Ironically, it's both, maybe not so ironically, it's both talking about sage symbols and it's, you know, cleverly trying to weave a story about what they might look like themselves. Um, I do in certain aspects of the essay try to hint at, which I hope to talk about in other works about what it, what it means to do polyhistoric work in a modern context. I, in fact, think it's a mistake to think historically that it was always about that if you just mastered certain texts that you, like the typical way of thinking about the Renaissance Enlightenment polyhistor is that they were the person who thought they could have an encyclopedia of the world. And, you know, even like the Phil Soft's Enlightenment encyclopedia, right, is this naive uh, optimism that we could really master and know everything. Well, not as that only bad Voltaire and Diderot scholarship about what they imagined they were doing, but I think kind of misses the essential point for them, which is this uh, trying to show other people about the value of being a, a part of an open society and engaged with lots of different aspects of life and learning. And I think for sure, even the people we kind of point to as models of this, that was important to them. It wasn't about capturing every field. I don't even think they, like, I, I, from the stuff I've read, it's like Voltaire and Diderot again, I don't think they ever really describe it that. They're trying to um, enact this vision of the Republic of Letters and what an open culture might look like for the world. And, you know, even uh, classical Asian examples like uh, uh, Zhu Ji, you know, who makes the four books and five classics in their kind of classical orientation. He's even clear about it. It's supposed to make this attentiveness to the world that returns us to ourselves with deeper insight about who we are, who and what we are, and how we should care for others. And only after generations, when you know, you know, you get Aristotle two thousand years later, does the thesis just mean reading Aristotle a particular way and knowing a certain amount of things. I actually think that's pretty new. So the last thing I'll say is maybe the big challenge is shifting us out of the kind of information age, stalking information, and being able to pick an attitude towards what it means to be an open person and a little more of this kind of broad subject oriented version of it may be part of the more difficult task. Okay, uh, Ralph has a question. We're running out of time and then Martin has a question. If you make them fast, we can get both in. Sure, I'll do quick, I promise. You're muted, okay. Ralph. I'm muted. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so this is very quick. Uh, I noticed you used a few Heideggerian concepts and phrases in your paper. And I think that there's a lot that's really good and useful and important in Heidegger's philosophical work. <laughs> but after the, uh, and you see where I'm going. After oh, yeah, the, everybody knows where this is going. <laughs> well, after the war, okay, his excuse to Hannah Arendt for why he became a Nazi was that he just didn't know anything about politics. And her question was, why weren't you at least a little bit motivated to find out? So in terms of your framework, how would you, how would you uh, account for this tension in Heidegger and, and other examples? He's just like an extreme example, but this tension, between the person's work and the person's life? Well, that's a great question. And the short answer is, I think it's one of the most interesting aspects of philosophy as a way of life scholarship. And another where Ado is often missed because he's particularly adept at it. Because I think you're right that in fact, it's a difficulty with any philosopher we talked about. There's no such thing as a, you know, 
a, I don't know what it would be, the, a complete lived way of life that's exact with your discourse, there's always some sort of productive tension. But the, the quick thing I will say about it is I, I do think it would be helpful for us in philosophy to have nuanced conversations about the relationship of the life of the philosopher to what they were saying. Not saying you can, like Kassir says in all of his intellectual histories, it's not that you reduce it to the life or you reduce it to the discourse, but the relationship does matter. And somehow being attentive to that tension and what it means about who the person was and who we want to be is important. I don't have a magic answer there, but I, you know, I hope with like, you know, the recent stuff that's come out about some of Royce's racial writings or, you know, even the debates about Foucault, you know, the recent accusations that we consider them seriously and try to have nuanced conversations about the limits of the philosophers involved and in relation to the, to the work and to the kind of uh, philosopher we want to be. All right, Martin, very quickly. So I, I just like to inquire um, about that opposition between sage and philosopher, right? You use that term, uh, a sage model for philosophy of culture. So who is a sage uh, uh, contrasted to philosopher? Is that sagacity something primar uh, primary to philosophy, some uh, foundation of philosophy? And how does a sage becomes a sage? Or uh, does it have anything uh, with philosophy? Or maybe is a sage conceived as a uh, telos, uh, uh, ultimate philosopher becomes a sage? So what is the, uh, why do you need that category? So, and so, what, the, uh, what is the role of it, actually? Good question. And real quick, uh, there's a lot of different models of this. My own is I tend to like the stoic of it. You know, a sage is a non-exhaustive regulative ideal kind of tool. <laughs> to help us think about who and what we are. And you know, Stoics are famous for thinking there's no like little steps you can take to being the sage. It's always a kind of non-exhaustive in front, which is also what Kant took. And he decided to call that the philosopher themselves as he wrote in a number of places. As a philosopher is something we're striving towards. And I, I should have, if it's not clear, I, that's all I mean by the sage. It's a kind of non exhaustful playful topic. I even reduce it some more. The topic of conversation to consider what kind of person we would like to be as a philosopher.